Okay, so let's start. Hello, welcome. Great to be at a free BSD con and pardon Euro BSD con again. It's all the BSDs. Definitely missed that last year. And uh, yeah, too bad we cannot meet in person. I would really have loved that. But uh, let's start with my talk. Um, we have gathered some experience in running lots of jails on lots of machines. And I'm going to talk about the networking setup that we developed and the issues we have with that and our future plans. For people who don't know me yet, I'm, uh, ah, okay, agenda first. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit out of practice <laughs> giving presentations. Um, yeah, short introduction, then I'll present our current architecture, how we went IPv6 only for jails, because you probably heard that there is a depletion of IPv4 address space. What challenges we face specifically on layer two, and why I think that these challenges are rooted in Ethernet being not a proper paradigm for networking in the 21st century anymore. We'll see. I'm uh, working in IT since 86, started with Minix, been a FreeBSD user since 1993, and I managed the network and our data center operations at Punct.de. Punct.de is a hosting company and a software development company. I'm in the operations team, and we have three operators and one guy who is our Python wizard. Uh, coming from the development side and is getting into operating while teaching us operators how to write proper codes and use agile methods, use Git, use Ansible, all of this stuff. Punct.de uh, was founded in uh, 1996 as a RIPE member, a DNIC member, has a couple of web applications, uh, development teams, and as I said, one, one operations team. We use jails for hosting. So customers that want to host with us get the illusion of a root server that is located inside a FreeBSD jail. We maintain all the software. If you're not familiar with such a setup or how FreeBSD jails work, my presentation from EuroBSDCon in Paris is still up on YouTube. So you could uh, look into the architecture that we designed for hosting applications from the operating system, the file system layouts, and so on, point of view, how we do updates and all that stuff. Today is a networking day for me, so I uh, treat that as a given. We're running in jails. Jails, for a couple of years now, have the vImage or vNet feature in FreeBSD, which is a completely virtualized network stack. So you can have private interfaces, private firewall rules, private everything inside a jail to complete the illusion of a virtual machine. While the jails still run on a single kernel and are compared to our hypervisor, very lightweight, very fast to launch, tear down, provision, etc. The ePair interface uh, that we use is a virtual patch cable, one end inside the jail, one end on the host system. And the general setup is to bridge this to the wire by creating a bridge interface that contains the physical interface of the host and the jail's ePair interfaces. I show the architecture in a graphical way. There we are. So the blue box is the host. The host has got the network interface that is connected to some switch. And then we create a bridge interface that contains the physical interface and all the jails. And all the jails have the illusion of being connected to the regular network and run their own IP stack via VNet, can do their own routing, their own firewall rules, as I said. And uh, so that all looks pretty great and scales quite well for certain values of quite well. 
the view inside of such a jail is like this. The interfaces are called ePair0 for the first one, ePair1, etc. pp. And we have uh, two ends to each ePair interface. The ePair0A would be outside of the jail on the host. This is the one that we put into the bridge as a member. And the ePair0B is the one that is inside the jail. And as you can see, it's got INET6 link local address, it's got a global unicast address, it's got an IPv4 address, and the IPv4 address comes with a netmask of slash 24. So it's all really the illusion of a complete real host hardware to our customers, and they are quite happy with the product. We have one drawback at the moment. We're sometimes uh, reaching performance limits in FreeBSD 12. The bridge interface that we use used to be a bottleneck, being only single-threaded. Thanks to Christoph, who I saw is listening, uh, for working on improving that by a vast amount, one order of magnitude, I remember a factor of five or even more by making the bridge interface multi-threaded so it can run on multiple cores. So from that point of view, the bridge is not a problem anymore, but we will get to other drawbacks that we're facing later. We rolled out this four or even five years ago. We have in the order of a couple of hundred to slightly under a thousand jails running on 80, 90 physical servers in total. And uh, the first major change compared to what I laid out so far is that we were going IPv6 only. So because we uh, cannot afford to provision an IPv4 address for every single jail anymore, the standard product that customers get now is only IPv6 and you can get an IPv4 address for your jail for an additional fee. But of course, we make sure that all the applications that our customers want to run are reachable via IPv6 and IPv4 all the same. So how do we do this? Um, we have the same layer two architecture with a bridge and everything, only that the jails don't have an IPv4 address. And we added a jail that we maintain that runs a gate 64 setup, which serves as a gateway for all the jails to reach IPv4 targets, and which serves as a reverse gateway proxy for customers who are on IPv4 and want to reach their jails. The egress part works with NAT64. Um, there is a special address range in IPv6 networking that is reserved for this purpose. We route this address range through the gate 64 jail and the gate 64 jail does the net with the IP firewall that is native to FreeBSD. And for all of this to work, the resolver needs to lie about quad A records. I'll show that in a short demo. Let's see this one. So for people who are possibly oh, okay, there we are. Possibly in their forties or fifties like I am and a bit vision impaired. I hope this is large enough for everyone to see. Great. So this is inside a jail. The product is called the Pro Servers. So all the jails are called Virtual Pro Servers. That's why it's VPro. And then there are just numbers, cattle, not pets. And the external interface, as you can see here, has got only IPv6 configured. Now, when we want to ping a host that is 
only reachable via IPv4. This does not work. Network is unreachable because we don't have any IPv4 connectivity. But when we ask for a quad A record, which github.com does not have, then our name server fakes this address. Fake because this is the special address range used for NAT64, and this is just the IPv4 address that we got in the last request over here, this one encoded in hex. There's even a special syntax. You can write NAT64 addresses like this. And this way, all our IPv6 only pro servers can reach destinations on the internet that only have IPv4. So they ask for a quad A because they are running a strictly IPv6 stack. The name server lies and gives them a NAT64 address, and the NAT64 gateway takes care of uh, translating from IPv6 to IPv4 and vice versa. So that's the egress part. And then of course we need to have an ingress part. For applications, we run an SNI proxy. SNI is short for server name identification or indication, server name indication. Uh, this is an extension to the TLS SSL standard. The problem with uh, SSL as originally designed was that the the HTTPS traffic was encrypted right away. So you go directly into the key exchange, uh, certificate exchange, certificate check stuff between the web browser and uh, the web server. And you, have, you cannot indicate a host header before going into the cryptographic exchange, which led to the undesirable situation that you needed to know which certificate to use on the server side up front. And so you needed essentially an IP address per SSL enabled web server. This was changed with SNI. So the browser now tells the server which host it wants to connect to. Then the web server can pick the proper certificate and then the key exchange and everything starts. SNI works not only with HTTPS, although the reason for it to come into existence is HTTPS, it works also with HTTP, which is important in our setup because we need HTTP for Let's Encrypt. The quad record of, say, www.customer.de points to the JL proper, to the IPv6 address that the JL has got natively. And the A record points to the gate 64 j And what then happens is that the browser connects to the SNI proxy. If it has only IPv4 available requests with SNI and indicating the host name that a certain web page is to be served. And then the proxy looks up the IPv6 target address via regular DNS. And if this is in the permitted range, i.e. it is in our data center, otherwise you could use our proxies to anonymously connect to any target on the internet. But if it's on the same host or in our data center, then uh, the request is permitted. And then the SNI proxy connects via TCP, not via HTTP proxying, but via a particular TCP proxy protocol to the web server via IPv6, and then the regular key exchange certificate uh, negotiation stuff starts, and you get a proper HTTPS connection with encryption and, and everything that you want. The most common problem that the customers face with this setup is that they forget to set a quad A record, because most corporate and enterprise people out there still think only in IPv4, even today. But uh, generally, 
with our support, this works really well for web requests. All the applications are available uh, via v4 and v6. We run Nextcloud or other complex stuff, including WebSockets, uh, through this setup, and we don't face any problems with that. For other applications, things don't look quite as well. We have a native IPv6, of course, for SSH or a jump host that customers can configure. And if you want to access your MySQL database, your Elastic, whatever, you need to use an SSH tunnel if you're only IPv4 connected because uh, we have no host name where proxy like we have with, with SNI proxy for all these applications. And we are not sure how we are going to handle uh, Quick, the new HTTP successor protocol designed at Google. HTTP2 is already enabled across all our servers and works really well. But uh, Quick, sorry, no clue if SNI proxy in tends to uh, implement that if it's even in the protocol that you can do SNI. I don't know at the current point of time. So that's the IPv6 address depletion topic. And I'm quite happy with the solution we developed. So let's uh, switch to the next topic, which is challenges we have with network infrastructure. Um, I'll link this bug, uh, which was the first indication that something we do might be not quite optimal. Um, this is not to, to blame anyone. Bugs do happen. And uh, Christoph and Bjorn have been uh, really, really, really great help to finally track this down and fix it. The fun part about this bug is it only happened in our data center in production. Nobody else was seeing this. Specifically, uh, Christoph and Bjorn could not reproduce it on their development machines or in test setups. Absolutely no way. So what's happening? What we saw uh, was that for some reason an entire pro server host, a physical machine, stopped forwarding traffic to all of the jails that were hosted on this machine at once. No traffic in, no traffic out. And this happened every couple of weeks, every couple of days, and it happened more frequently as our data center grew and we provisioned more hosts and more jails. The nature of the bug is that the ePair interface has got, as a real hardware Ethernet interface would have too, has got a transmit and receive queue where you can queue up packets. And uh, due to the bug, whenever that queue filled up to the brim, then the interface stopped forwarding packets. This is hard to reproduce if you have a single connection and a single development machine because even with a one gigabit stream TCP running at full speed, you will not fill up the interface queue. So what's different in production? Well, what's different in production is we have broadcasts and we have lots of them. Of all the packets that our host sends and receives, including all the JS running on the host, of course, 40% of all the packets are broadcast or multicast packets. Only 60% is traffic directed at a unicast address, which is quite a mouthful. So what happened is that you have, for some reason, a bit more of this broadcast traffic that is received by the bridge interface on the host. And then because it's broadcast, it's simultaneously forwarded to all of the EPA interfaces on all of the jails, filling up the queue. And when the queue is full, the interface stopped working. So what to do about it? As I said, Bjorn was really helpful told me how to increase the queue length 
there's a SysCTL parameter that can do that, which is not very well documented. Then, of course, you can fix the bug that makes the interface freezing. I'm not quite sure if the final rework of the ePair is already in the source tree. Uh, the bug proper seems to be fixed. But, of course, this entire situation is not really optimal. We have 40% broadcast packets and seriously, folks, this, this just sucks. Um, in 2010 or so, I attended a conference in Cologne with a focus on OpenStack. And one of the companies that deployed OpenStack, which is a private cloud infrastructure as open source product, uh, told us how they first naively deployed OpenStack for their customers. And as soon as they had a couple of hundred customers with VMs running on this OpenStack cluster, suddenly the router connected to uh, that network crashed because the ARP cache of that router was just overflowing, as was the neighbor discovery cache for IPv6. So if we want to communicate on the ethernet in such a large network with lots of virtual machines and lots of jails, commonly called a broadcast domain, we need to broadcast packets to do address resolution. And how do we get rid of them? Okay, first step, move the bridge of the wire. There is actually no need to have the bridge interface that connects all the jails and the gate 6.4 to connect it on layer 2 to the host interface and the local area network. Again, I can show you what that looks like in production. Like we have it running. This is a pro server host with that setup. And if you look at the interfaces of that host, then we have the physical interface. We rename all of our interfaces. So we have uh, the same names for external connections and everything else across different hardware variants. This is an IGB, I think. And we rename all the external interfaces of the hosts to uh, INET0. The INET0 interface, this host is not in our data center. It's uh, located at Hetzner in Nuremberg. And they give us a single IPv4 address for that host. And they give us uh, slash 64 for IPv6. And they statically route this address and this slash 64 to the MAC address that the host has got. Now to host virtual pro servers, i.e. jails. We create yet another bridge, of course. But this bridge called jail0 is not connected to any physical interface. This host is running only one jail at the moment. And as you can see, the member interfaces of the bridge, there is only one which is our jail. If you pay for them, you get additional IPv4 addresses for hosting in the regular routable sizes. So we order at Hetzna a slash 29 with all the pro server hosts, and then we can flexibly offer customers either a dedicated IPv4 address or our gate 64 NAT64 setup, as I just showed. In this case, we have a dual stack pro server and in the jail interface, we have one address out of this slash 29 assigned to the bridge. And this address serves as the default gateway for the jail. So there is no need to connect the bridge to the local area network and fetch all the broadcasts that are floating around there. We just have uh, broadcasts if there are multiple jails 
on the bridge proper, which is not as much of a problem as putting a couple of hundred JOS on a single wire. And of course, the host itself is acting as a gateway in this case. So forwarding for IPv6 and for is enabled. And I said Hetzner is giving us a slash 64 for, for the entire host and as many GS as we like. So as with the IPv4 that I showed for the IPv6, we have one address with the regular prefix length of 64 on this bridge interface. And again, all the JS use this router as their default gateway. And additionally, and this is the first time I show a neat trick that we are planning to use with v4 and v6 all alike in a future development, you can actually split a net or assign single addresses to other interfaces if you use a prefix length of slash 32 or slash 128, depending on if you're talking v4 or v6. So this is the same prefix that has no assigns. We use the first address for the external interface of the host, so we can reach the host via IPv6 and use a prefix length of 128. And due to this prefix length, we can easily assign the rest of the network, the slash 64, to our bridge interface and use it for days. For jails, we have come to uh, randomly generate IPv6 addresses because if uh, slash 64 is really, really large, for uh, listeners who might not be familiar with IPv6 that much, slash 64 means it's the entire old IPv4 internet squared. So uh, that's really a heck of a lot of potential hosts. And if you use random addresses for your hosts and rely on DNS, that means that nobody can linearly scan your network for active hosts to attack, which is, of course, security by obscurity. But in that case, I think it works. If you just start at one and then go two, three, four, five, people can scan your network for hosts and will find active machines. In that case, all of the IP addresses are random which is definitely an advantage here. But this setup, I think, shows that routing might be a good idea. Because um, if we use layer 3 instead of layer 2, we might be able to solve the jail VM mobility problem. If I want to move a jail from one host to another one, I can at the moment only move it to a host which has an interface in the same VLAN because all the addressing is limited by connection to a certain layer two broadcast domain. And I might want to move jails around, have them on central storage, do high availability. If one host crashes, just fire up the jails on another host. So um, yeah. That's not optimal and maybe getting all this layer two stuff, all this ethernet stuff out of the way might be a good idea after all. And uh, all the big guys already do it. So uh, the cloud providers like Amazon and the hyperscalers who run their own infrastructure like Facebook, they all have layer three addressing and announce routes for they their containers, VMs, whatever they are using, if it's if it's Docker, if it's KVM, they announce these routes via VGP internally. So any instance, jail in our case, can move to an arbitrary host and the routing just takes care of the reachability. The downside, as uh, some of my colleagues would feel about it, you need a dynamic routing protocol daemon on each host, like OpenBGPD. I, being traditionally a network and, and Cisco and, and hardware guy, have absolutely no problem with this line of thinking. 
uh, my dear colleague Wolfgang doesn't like the idea, but yeah, we'll talk about it in a constructive way, and I think this is a necessary way to go for us. Next, why do I want to get rid of Ethernet? What, what's the problem with Ethernet? And why do I want to have only layer 3 routing? Ethernet is this. Yep, that's what you think of when I say Ethernet. You think of switches, you think of uh, CAT6, whatever, twisted pair cable. But all our protocols pretend it's still this. So um, what is this? This is a yellow cable with a vampire transceiver. A little bit of a history lesson. This is the original Ethernet. And um, the original Ethernet was a coaxial cable, which is more or less a medium for radio waves. And all stations were connected to this coaxial cable via these vampire transceivers. And any packet sent by any station on the net was simultaneously, more or less, <laughs> we have to consider the speed of light, but simultaneously by all stations that are listening. So this is a broadcast medium. Every packet goes to all the stations. And that's why our protocols are designed the way they are. All stations are listening, and then the network interfaces just save and forward to the operating system the frames that have the proper MAC address. And that's why we need hardware addresses on such a medium. And uh, yeah, sorry, period. Um, but this is not the reality we have nowadays. The reality when we have this is that each of these links is not a broadcast medium at all. It's all point-to-point, -point. it's all full duplex, it's all with flow control. On the links, there is that cable or that port or anything notwithstanding, but on the cable, there is never a single bit lost. Packets get dropped when forwarded by the switch and when the forwarding queue of the switch is exhausted or when the interface receive queue of a station, i.e. a host and the operating system is exhausted. But these links have perfect forwarding properties like any serial link that you might know. And uh, actually the internet was originally developed on serial links only. So those, we had those internet message processors and uh, wide, wide area links from universities to universities and all this ethernet stuff came in rather lately. So the switches actively work to forward all the broadcasts. And in my opinion, the MAC addresses and the layer two addresses and the necessity of MAC addresses and hence um, ARP and NDP are a relic of the past. The switch, which most switches have layer 3 capability nowadays anyway, could just as well just use IP addresses and know which host is on which interface. It would be perfectly possible. Unfortunately, our current stack does not work this way. And if we had an interface working like this, we would immediately solve a whole number of problems. So my question for the development community, which I would really love to discuss with Christoph later, uh, can we have a VNet point-to-point -point interface, please? Because on point-to-point -point interfaces, you don't need IP addresses. Serial links can be run without IP addresses on the links completely. You just set routes to the interface. And you don't need transfer networks if you want to conserve IP addresses. So we have no leaking RFC 1918 addresses in trace routes. And you don't have ARP or NDP cache depletion attacks like the hosting company that uh, deployed a too large broadcast domain with their initial open stack efforts. So all these problems 
vanish the moment we abandon Ethernet, which is, of course, not going to happen. But for VNet, VNet is already a completely virtualized environment. So, on, and our jails are a virtualized environment, and there is really no fundamental necessity to emulate Ethernet to connect the jail. If we could have a point-to-point -point link comparable to ePair that we can use to connect a host to a jail and vice versa, and just ditch the bridge and do all on layer three and do all with routing, I think that would improve matters in terms of scalability, resilience, and uh, jail mobility quite a bit. I'm currently actively working on a solution that we can deploy in the meantime. If you use a slash 32 netmask for IPv4 and a slash 128 for IPv6, you can actually reuse IP addresses on as many interfaces as you like. So my idea is to use this addressing scheme and directly address the interfaces connected to the jails all without a bridge. I'll show how that's supposed to work uh, in a couple of minutes. This is the desired setup. So we have slash 32 addresses, no bridge interface, and the host is just configured as a router. I've tried to do this with current with current jail tools. Now, just a sec. Where are we? And um, IOCage, for example, will not, as it currently stands, work this way. But as you can see here, I assigned an address completely out of the range of my local network. We ha I have uh, on, on this Freenas system with IOCage a couple of jails, and they have the regular setup. are all connected to the bridge and all the jails vnet interfaces are a member of the bridge as you can see but for the single jail for the short demonstration i removed the jail interface from the bridge and i assigned an ip address completely outside of the range i have here on my local area network so hello computer Here we are. Uh, okay, so console con. So inside the jail, we have this single IP address with a slash 32 net mask. And the routing table looks like this. The default gateway does not point to a particular IP address, but instead it points to an interface. You can do things like this already in, in FreeBSD just right now, like root I'm sorry, I'm a bit puzzled what's happening in my network currently. Okay, I see you all typing away so my uplink and my network in general is working maybe i messed up something with my experiments here but nonetheless lkh exec okay 
uh, I already showed you that that I have an interface route for for this thing. Okay. So and then on the host, I did the following. I, Oh my dear God, I still have a VPN connection active. The wonders of the internet, we have good sound and video, and I'm routing all the packets via USA. Let me disable that. So back again, I hope. <laughs> Let's restart the screen sharing. So sorry, I seem like I cannot get the screen sharing up to work again, which is bad. But that's oh my darn! I would really, I would love to show you the last couple of slides. But the um, the live demo would really not go any farther than showing that I'm able to ping. A jail this way uh, via static routing to the internet. Um, that was the last thing I wanted to show. I already reconnected to the uh, BBB. I just did a refresh. That's why the camera stopped working. I reauthorized the camera and I was trying to reauthorize the screen sharing, but I was at the penultimate slide anyway. So we can, in my opinion, jump right into a bit of questions and discussion. All of this took me longer than I expected, really. Uh, so we don't have much uh, room, but I will, of course, be available in the hallway track and uh, for the rest of the day and tomorrow. And we can chat if you like. So thank you very much for listening so far. Um, Deep Drop argued that you should never point default routes to an IP. Well, how do you do this in the case of Ethernet? If you have 50 hosts on a slash 24, they all point to the upstream gateway via IP. There is no way to do this with an, uh, with an interface route. That's why I'm arguing that I want to have a point-to-point -point interface instead of Ethernet. So I can use interface routes for all of this. That's it. That's exactly the point. Any any other questions? Yeah, sure. Of course, you can hardwire the MAC address. Do you preserve the layer three, layer four addresses with the HA proxy proxy protocol? Yes, we do. Um, we preserve via proxy protocol the, the real client addresses outside, so you can use blacklists and, and everything. I do 
not understand the question about IPv6 enumeration. You said that you generate random uh, host IDs. Yes. For, and if your customers are expected to use something like Let's Encrypt, um, their host name will appear in the certificate transparency log, which every attacker can consume. Yeah, but it's, it's an additional step. With IPv4, we just see swipes of the entire network 24 times 7. And to make this unfeasible for IPv6, we use sparse address space by scattering all the hosts randomly over the slash 64. I still think it's a good idea. Um, yes, uh, jail addresses need to be stable. <laughs> That's exactly the point or the problem with the mobility uh, requirement. If we want mobility for jails from host to host, we must preserve IPv4 and IPv6 addresses because we do not know which DNS entries the customer has got pointing to that jail. If this was all cloud infrastructure with central ingress and everything, we could, of course, just renumber the jails. But the jails are rented by customers with um, are rented by customers as a full stack virtual machine, and uh, many of them manage their own DNS and point arbitrary names to the jails that we simply do not know. No, we don't assign a separate slash sixty four for each customer. We currently we have one VLAN for v4 and for v6, and we have one slash 64 and one IPv6 address per jail. How do you handle abuse inside a slash 64? What do you mean by by abuse? Faking of addresses, um, the jails cannot change their address after they are booted up. They are just locked in terms of addressing. Okay, outgoing SMTP scam. Well, no, we 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 don't. We simply don't. If we receive an abuse report, we take appropriate measures, but we have we have only business to business customers. I you you we have no self provisioning portal. You cannot just click a jail in our infrastructure and start spamming away. Uh, you need to have our sales department contact you, written offer, contract, order stuff like that and then the operating department will the the operating team will provision your jail so we know who our customers are which uh, takes care of the abuse well, this is not unusual broadcast traffic this is just a vlan with 20 or 30 hosts and all that ndp and arp and all the other stuff plus people scanning our network from outside, of course, which generates ARP requests for hosts that are not even online, but they go out via broadcast through all the jails that are connected. This is not yet a real problem. It's just striking how much of broadcast traffic is present on a network. VLAN per customer, well, VLAN per customer does not scale. If you want to have hundreds or even thousands of them, VXLAN lacks in terms of security. And how do we connect the VXLANs to anything that is physical infrastructure? At the moment, in the FreeBSD model, we have this bridge thing again. That's why I'm asking if we can have a point to point VNet interface that I can use to route. Okay, anything open? I think I've 
tried my best to answer all of the questions. I do not claim that I have answers to all the problems. I was just I want, just wanted to show you what we are currently doing and where we think this entire setup should be going. We will definitely uh, put further development effort into this slash 32 slash 128 ePair setup. I'm um, not quite sure about if we should uh, enhance IO cage to the point that it can handle things like that. IO cage just makes many, many assumptions that are hard coded about how your network, what your network topology looks like, which was great when we started. That's why we picked IO cage. It just worked. But for example, you cannot fire up a VNet jail with IO cage without IO cage creating a bridge interface if you do not already have one pre-configured. So if we really want to go that route, we either have to patch IO cage and of course uh, submit merge requests or switch uh, the tooling. I'm uh, planning to look into Bastille because it looks really well and with a much cleaner architecture. There is much, much ad hocery in, in IO cage, unfortunately, and things cast in code that should not be in code, but in configuration. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. And as I said, I will be available for chat later myself. I intend to chat a bit with Christoph, with, with Bjorn, if, I can, if he is present and if I can get him and everyone else who is interested to discuss networking. Which corner of the hallway track? There's a free BSD area. Um, Raymond, uh, look into CBSD. I'm I'm gonna, planning to look into Bastille. So far. And as for the hallway track, if I remember correctly from my quick checks yesterday, there are separate areas for the various BSDs. So let's meet in the free BSD corner. I'll just restart my network and my browser uh, so I get a clean connection and webcam and everything again. Thanks.